but we'll go over hemochromatosis, Wilson's disease, and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency now. So hemochromatosis is an autosomal dump, autosomal recessive, excuse me, disorder characterized by iron overload. It's caused by a defect in the HFE, which is a term for high iron gene on chromosome six. And for me, I remember that it's on chromosome six because I think of the high FE has six letters. Uh, two mutations that are worth knowing they do test this occasionally, this C282Y and H63D mutation. I, I don't have a useful mnemonic for those. Those are just uh, two mutations that you do have to keep in mind though for hemochromatosis. Also occasionally it's associated with this HLA-A3 subtype. So what I wanna do is I wanna discuss hemochromatosis pathogenesis. Uh, we've talked about this in the small intestine lecture because I, I wanted to let you know that I, I showed you how normal iron, or iron absorption works. So we'll go over that again here, though. So normally what's going to happen is that iron is absorbed by our duodenal enterocytes. And here's our duodenum. This, again, is from our small intestine anatomy section. And I just mentioned here that the duodenum, duodenum is very important for iron absorption. And our total iron levels are tightly regulated by a protein called hepcidin, or it can also be referred to as hepcidin. And if you ever have defective hepcidin production, you're gonna get increased intestinal iron absorption into the bloodstream. And all this excess iron, the problem with the excess iron is that it can undergo something called the Fenton reaction which will cause free radical damage to many, many organs. And so this, I'm gonna start it off by talking about the exact same mechanism we discussed in the small intestine regarding uh, normal iron absorption. So on the top, we have our GI lumen. I drew a couple of duodenal enterocytes. I also have the bloodstream at the bottom and the liver. And there's two different types of iron. You can have heme iron and non-heme iron. So heme iron is the type of iron that you usually get if you consume like meat products and that meat already has red blood cells that have iron in them and heme. So what's gonna happen is that that consumed red blood cell will have heme and it'll have globin. And that heme can actually be transported into the enterocyte through a heme transporter. And from there, now that heme can be broken down, the iron from that heme can be uh, broken down. And so you'll have Fe2 plus. From there, and I just wanna clarify the difference between Fe2 plus and three plus. So Fe2 plus is called ferrous iron. And what we'll find, especially when we have to absorb non-heme iron is that ferrous iron is often the form of iron. So that two plus is the form that can actually be uh, moved across the membrane, so for, from the GI lumen to the enterocyte, or even from the enterocyte into the bloodstream, it has to be in that Fe2 plus or ferrous form. On the other hand, this Fe3 plus form here is called ferric iron, and this is more of our storage iron, and all of our storage iron is, as, is also stored as ferritin, which is also in the three plus form. And how I remember the difference between Fe2 plus, I just remember like a Ferris wheel has uh, the ideal amount of people on a Ferris wheel at one time or two people because you're, you know, you're going on a nice date on the Ferris wheel. And then if your friend Eric comes along, then you'll have this ferric form with three people on the Ferris wheel, which is not ideal. So kind of moving back. So this Ferris iron has two choices. Once it is degraded, the heme, uh, once the Ferris iron is taken out of the heme, it has two choices. It can either be stored in the enterocyte itself in this ferric form, this three plus form, or it can use something called the ferroportin enzyme to actually get transported from the duodenal enterocyte and into the bloodstream directly. Let's talk about how non-heme iron works. There's a little bit of a difference in the, especially within the GI lumen. So non-heme iron 
normally starts at that as that uh, ferric form. And remember what I just said is that that ferric form is not the ideal number of, it's not the ideal number. The ferrous form is what we want in order to transport it into our enterocyte. So what has to happen first is that you have to have a cytochrome B uh, help convert that iron from the ferric form to the ferrous form. And it does this with using vitamin C as a cofactor. And that's why sometimes when you are prescribed iron tablets, sometimes they'll prescribe it with vitamin C to enhance absorption through this mechanism. So now that we have it in that ferrous form, we need to get it into the cell and we have to use these DMT1 transporter to get it into the cell. Now keep in mind, this transporter is a divalent metal transporter. So it's not specific to just the two plus form of iron. It's any divalent metal. So all of these divalent metals can also use this same transporter. And that's why if you ever took an iron tablet and drank a lot of milk with it, you might actually have decreased absorption because this DMT1 transporter might be using all of its resources to absorb the calcium instead of your iron that you really want in the enterocyte. And again, once, it, once this iron makes it into the enterocyte and it's in this ferrous form, it can do the same two steps that we saw for this heme iron. It can either be stored in the enterocyte in the ferric form, or it can use that same ferroportin enzyme to be released into the bloodstream. And now once it's released into the bloodstream, the iron does the same thing. It can either be, it's usually converted quickly back to this ferric form. And uh, from this ferric form, it can actually bind to a molecule called transferrin. And most of our iron that's floating in our bloodstream is attached to, is bound to this molecule called transferrin. It's a good way to move the iron around in the bloodstream. Now, ultimately, we don't want all the iron just floating around in the bloodstream as transferrin. We want a place to store it as ferritin. And so what's going to happen is that this ferric form of iron or ferritin has three places that it predominantly likes to store. It can store in the splenic macrophages, it can store in the bones, and a common place for uh, iron storage is in our liver. So now let's discuss how this whole process can be regulated to help control the amount of iron that's in our bloodstream at a given time. So let's say we have a situation where we have a ton of iron in our bloodstream. What can our body do to counteract this? Well, our liver can produce an enzyme called, a, a hormone called hepcidin. And what hepcidin can do is it can interact with these ferroportin uh, enzymes, these transporters, and it can inhibit ferroportin. And so what'll happen if you inhibit ferroportin is that you will not, no longer have all of this ferrous iron able to escape the duodenal enterocyte into the bloodstream. So if no iron is entering the bloodstream anymore, you're gonna have decreased levels of iron in your blood. And so that's a good way to regulate it when your iron levels are too high. So what happens in hemochromatosis though, is that this hepcidin gene right here, this hepcidin hormone is defective. So we don't, we don't produce that hepcidin that we really need. And if you don't have any hepcidin, then these ferroportin uh, molecules are able to roam freely. There's nothing to inhibit them from transporting all of the iron in the duodenal enterocyte into the bloodstream. And so you're gonna get iron overload. And so the symptoms of hemochromatosis are all related to iron overload. It's just in different parts of the body, they would cause different things. So let me put a couple of the organs out there and let's talk about what happens when you have too much iron in each of these organs. So in the liver, if you have too much iron, you're gonna have uh, liver cirrhosis over time. I mentioned briefly that all that iron that gets into your bloodstream can undergo a Fenton reaction and cause free radical damage. And so if you have too much free radical damage in your liver, it'll ultimately cause inflammation and cirrhosis. And as we've discussed many times now, anytime you have liver cirrhosis, that can 
increase your risk of developing hepatocellular carcinoma. And in the case of hemochromatosis, HCC is the most common cause of death. In the pancreas, all of that iron deposition can actually destroy your islets of Langerhans. And we know we needed our islets of Langerhans to produce things like beta cells. And if you have a lack of beta cells, if they're getting destroyed by all this iron definition, uh, deposition, you can end up with new onset diabetes. All the iron that's deposited in the skin causes this classic bronze pigmentation. In your heart, the deposition can cause either a restrictive cardiomyopathy or a dilated cardiomyopathy. If you have iron in your joints, you can get something called pseudo gout, which is calcium pyrophosphate deposition. This seems kind of low yield, but I've seen this on a number of tests where they give you somebody who has calcium pyrophosphate disease and they give you some other nonspecific, some other symptoms that appear nonspecific at first, but then you realize that it is actually part of this entire hemochromatosis clinical picture. So I would remember that calcium pyrophosphate, that pseudo gout. And finally, if you have iron depositing in your pituitary gland, you're going to get a loss of hormones from your pituitary gland, and that can lead to hypogonadism. And I just wanted to highlight this because the classic presentation that you hear about in hemochromatosis is this bronze diabetes, and that's because of this iron deposition in your pancreas and in your skin. But don't forget some of these other ones, especially, I mean, the cirrhosis is super important. Uh, I've also seen this restrictive cardiomyopathy and the pseudo gout tested quite a bit. So how do we uh, evaluate whether somebody has hemochromatosis or not? So on laboratory studies, if we take somebody and give them an iron panel, they want you to know what, what laboratory markers are gonna be shown. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that your iron levels will be increased in a condition like hemochromatosis because there's no counter-regulatory mechanism to, to turn off the iron, essentially. Your ferritin, which is the storage form of iron, will also be increased. Your total iron binding capacity will be decreased. This TIBC is always inverse to ferritin. I think Pathoma mentioned that one time, and it's a very helpful tip. I'm going to go over this in a pictorial representation in a moment, so keep that in mind. And our percent saturation will also be increased. So what I want to do is I want to talk about each of those four lab values, just so everybody's on the same page as to why these lab values hold true. So our total iron is the amount of iron that's in your body. I mentioned that once your iron gets in your bloodstream, the majority of it gets quickly attached to transfer transferrin to move through the bloodstream. And so in a condition like hemochromatosis, where our ferroportin receptors, I mean, our ferroportin uh, enzymes here can pretty much roam freely without any counter-regulation, you're gonna get a ton of iron in our bloodstream. Most of that iron will attach to transferrin and we can measure all that iron. And in this case, we're gonna have uh, excessive iron. And so our total iron will be increased. Our ferritin is the amount of iron that's stored. And so again, if you have all this transfer in here, all this iron in your bloodstream, a lot of it's gonna go into the splenic macrophages, the bones, or the liver. And so you'll get a ton of storage iron, also known as ferritin, and that can be measured and, and that'll be increased on laboratory studies. Your total iron binding capacity that measures your ability of proteins like transferrin to bind free iron. So it's their capacity to bind free iron. Notice though, that in a condition that has a ton of iron in your blood, that'll basically saturate all of your transferrin molecules. So your ability to bind additional free iron molecules is gonna be decreased because most of the iron, most of the sites that this, this transferrin has are already bound by a ferric form of iron. So your TIBC in this case will be decreased because these free iron, these free ferric molecules don't have an ability to bind to these transferrin, these saturated transferrin molecules. Lastly, let's talk about transferrin saturation. This is pretty much the same thing. 
there's an equation here that you can use if you'd like, where it takes the total serum iron divided by the total iron capacity, the total iron binding capacity, and you multiply that by 100%. And this will estimate the percentage of transfer and binding sites that are saturated with iron. So in this example, where you have eight total binding sites and only four of them are bound to, only four of the eight sites actually have something bound to them, that could give you a theoretical saturation of 50%. In this case here though, and this is more consistent with hemochromatosis, you have a significant transfer and saturation. All your sites are bound, so you get you know, a, an increased saturation. I wanna point out though, even in hemochromatosis, you don't usually get 100% saturation. It's not close to that, but just the example holds true that the percent saturation will be significantly increased in a condition like hemochromatosis. On biopsy, this will show hemosiderin on a Prussian blue stain. So hemosiderin is a conglomerate. It has ferritin, lipids, lysosomes, and other proteins. It's basically a trash dump. And in this case, it'll contain lots of ferritin. Your body essentially doesn't have anywhere else to put this ferritin. So it'll kind of try to store it in this, in this form. And the thing is we have other uh, we have other compounds in our body or other organelles in our body, I should say, that also act as these trash dumps. For example, as you age, you're gonna have this thing called lipofusion that's gonna accumulate in your cells as well. And this is not ferritin. This is just your normal debris that it can't be excreted. And so why I mention this is that if you ever wanna distinguish I wonder if this is hemosiderin. Is this some sort of ferritin that's being stored in my cell? Or is this just our, our normal cellular debris that we couldn't excrete, this lipofusion? If you want to find out if it's hemosiderin versus lipofusion, you can use this Prussian blue stain. And in this example here, you can see they stained this in Prussian blue, and it will light up all the ferritin in blue. So that's that's in hemochromatosis, you're going to see this. If you ever stain it with Prussian blue, you're going to see these blue dots everywhere within the cells. And that's the hemosiderin that contains ferritin scattered throughout the cells. In contrast, this is an example of that lipofusion. And if you stained this on Prussian blue, you would not see any blue granules in here. So how do we treat hemochromatosis? One way we can do it, because there's so much iron within our bloodstream, we can actually use a phlebotomy. We can take out some of that blood and to basically ameliorate some of that excess iron. You can also chelate iron, and there's several medications that are used to chelate iron, basically to bind to that iron so it doesn't deposit in any of those tissues and cause the problems that we discussed earlier. You can use deferoxamine, Deferazerox and uh, deferoprone. These are just common chelators. So anything, if you're on a test, just think about this, this defer as iron chelators. So now let's switch it up. And instead of talking about iron overload, we're gonna talk about Wilson's disease, which is essentially copper overload. So this like hemochromatosis is also an autosomal recessive disorder. And this it results in deficient copper transport in our liver cells. And what's going to happen if we have deficient copper transport, it's the copper will end up accumulating in our liver, cause damage, and it'll be released into the bloodstream and also affect other tissues. This is caused by a defect in the ATP7B gene on chromosome 13, and I remember that this ATP7B gene affects chromosome 13 because if you look at my mnemonic here, you can see that it looks like ATP7B, but it's actually 13. So you can just look, if you combine the one and the three like I did here, it can show you your ATP7B gene. And while we're here, I just wanted to emphasize that there's another condition that they're gonna want you to know about for step one and level one. Um, so I'm not going to go over this in great detail, but my quiz question is, which disease 
is related to a defect in the ATP7A gene. And that is actually Menke's disease. And it's an X-linked recessive. And I always remember that by the K in Menke's kind of already looks like an X. To help me remember that's an X-linked uh, disorder. And we mentioned that Wilson's disease is caused by a copper, defective copper reg regulation in liver cells, while Menke's disease is actually caused by defective copper regulation in non-liver cells. And so you're gonna get a developmental delay, failure to thrive, as well as this classic uh, brittle hair or kinky hair. And this usually shows up on tests. I, I don't remember seeing a question on Menke's that didn't have this specifically. But we'll go back to Wilson's disease. I just wanted to point out that there is a similar disease that has you know, a somewhat similar mechanism where it's related to copper. <clears throat> but moving back to Wilson's disease, I wanna talk about that ATP7B uh, in, in a little bit more detail. So that enzyme can serve two primary functions in hepatocytes. The first thing it can do is it can take all that copper and it can actually package it into this transport protein called ceruloplasmin. And once it's packaged into ceruloplasmin, you can successfully absorb that into the bloodstream. The other thing it can do is it can take some of the excess copper that you might have and it can package those into vesicles and that, that can all be excreted into the bile and out of the body. So as you can probably already see what's gonna happen, if you have a defect in that ATP7B gene and you don't have enough of that enzyme anymore, that protein, what's gonna happen is that that copper can accumulate in hepatocytes. And remember from hemochromatosis, we talked about how all that excess iron can undergo a Fenton reaction and cause free radical damage. What's gonna happen here is that somewhat similar in that copper will accumulate and it can also undergo a reaction to cause free radical damage. And ultimately, if the damage is severe enough, those hepatocytes that you have will start to die off and their membranes will they'll start to break and you're gonna have leakage of all that free copper into your bloodstream. So let's talk now about what normal copper regulation looks like. So I mentioned that there's two primary functions to this ATP7B protein. And we're, we're gonna go over each of these functions. So let's assume that copper is absorbed into a hepatocyte. Normally what happens is that our ATP7B gene will package some of that copper up into ceruloplasmin, and then that can be successfully released into our bloodstream and then into tissues that need that copper. The second thing it can do is it can package up some of that excess copper that's not required it puts those into vesicles and those can be released into the bile and ultimately excreted. So in Wilson's disease, we still have that copper being absorbed by the hepatocyte, but this time that ATP7B gene is non-functional. And so both of these, these functions are also not gonna work anymore. So instead of having this copper neatly packaged into ceruloplasmin, it's gonna be at free floating in your hepatocyte. And similarly, instead of this copper free uh, packaged nicely into this vesicle for excretion, that copper too will be out and about within your hepatocyte. And over time, that as that copper accumulates, you're gonna have free radicals forming. And so these free radicals can damage your hepatocyte. And once that happens and your hepatocyte doesn't have any more of its structural integrity, some of that copper can leak out into your bloodstream. So how will Wilson's disease present? Again, similar to hemochromatosis, the symptoms for Wilson's disease will just depend on what copper does when it deposits in certain organs. So in the liver, you're gonna have, you can have fatigue, abdominal pain, and jaundice. And then ultimately, if that damage is prolonged enough, you will get cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. In the brain, you can get several uh, psychiatric and neurological conditions such as dementia, psych uh, tremor, Parkinsonism. You can get mood disorders as well, 
through this. In the eye, you're going to get these classic uh, Kaiser Fleischer rings in Deschamais' membrane of the cornea. So I'm going to show you a Kaiser Fleischer ring. Here is our eye. You notice that there's a dark ring encircling the cornea. This dark ring is this dark ring is not uh, normal, and I've highlighted it there. And that's because all the copper is depositing in a Deschamais' membrane of the cornea. And they do want you to know this specific site, this Deschamais membrane, very, very important. And a mnemonic that I thought about with Kaiser Fleischer's ring, I always, to me, Kaiser Fleischer sounds like some old, like European, like almost like an Austrian empire. It sounds like some sort of empire. And so I always assume that they're known for their uh, copper rings and all the wealth that comes with that. So that's how I remember Kaiser Fleischer rings are associated with copper deposition and I and that'll help me remember that it's a, a complication of Wilton's disease specifically. In the kidney you can get renal disease something called Fanconi syndrome and in the red blood cells you can also get hemolytic anemia. These two I mentioned because they are on a couple of the study aids that I went through when I was making this PowerPoint. I will say these are much 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 lower yield. You definitely need to know this uh, Kaiser Fleischer rings. You definitely need to know cirrhosis. And I would know that it causes a, a wide variety of neurologic and psych symptoms. These three right here are much more uh, relevant on test day than these two. So when we talk about the laboratory findings for Wilson's disease, it can be tempting to simply measure the serum copper levels. And that's kind of what we did in hemochromatosis. We measured the serum iron levels and they were elevated. And that, that was one of the markers we were able to use. Well, I'm gonna go over why that doesn't always work. And it's actually better to measure their serum uh, ceruloplasmin levels. That's the best test you can do, uh, the best lab test you can do at least to diagnose Wilson's disease. If you measured their urinary copper, that it will usually be elevated. Their serum co copper is variable, and that's why we can't really use serum copper to check for Wilson's disease, because it might be high or low, depending on uh, if there's an acute flare-up or not. And, of course, the gold standard for most of these conditions is a biopsy, and the liver biopsy would show high copper levels. On a test, they're usually looking for you to pick the ceruloplasmin level first, though. You wouldn't want to go straight to a biopsy if, if you're concerned with somebody who might have Wilson's disease. You, the answer they're probably looking for is this. They want you to check for a, this serum ceruloplasmin first. And then if you're really suspicious, if, if these come back low ceruloplasmin, high urinary copper, then you could potentially consider a liver biopsy if you think it's necessary. So let's go over these laboratory findings. So the serum ceruloplasmin, we talked about this before, how ATP7B is able to neatly package these copper molecules into ceruloplasmin, and those can be released into your blood. If you don't have that ATP7B protein working, though, that copper is going to be free-flowing, and that ceruloplasmin won't be released into your blood. So you're going to end up with low ceruloplasmin levels. Urinary copper normally what's going to happen is that if you have this copper that's neatly packaged in ceruloplasmin like it should be, if it tries to get excreted, it's not going to because it's already part of this bigger entity. However, if you have, Will, uh, if you have Wilson's disease and you have copper that ends up leaking out, let's say after that hepatocyte gets damaged and some copper leaks out, now that free copper is, it can easily go through the kidneys and be excreted. So you're gonna have increased urinary copper. Serum copper is a little bit more confusing. And th the reason why we cannot use our serum copper reliably to measure whether somebody has Wilson's disease is that the, the levels will differ depending on where in the process you are. So let me explain that. Let's say you have an acute flare up where you have a lot of your hepatocytes have this free radical damage a lot, and it's causing inflammation and hepatocyte injury or death. And during this acute setting, a lot of copper is gonna spill out into your blood. So if you measured that all that copper, it would be elevated naturally. Over time though, 
as that copper you know gets excreted in your kidneys or let's say you've kind of reached this state where a lot of your hepatocytes have already died and you don't have that many hepatocytes dying and releasing a ton more copper in your bloodstream, you could end up with this situation where you don't have too much copper anymore left over in your blood. And when we actually measure copper on laboratory studies, in this case, let's say this is somebody who has normal uh, ceruloplasma, normal ATP7B, it's all packaged nicely. When we measure serum copper, we're actually measuring all of this copper too. So we're measuring the copper that's correctly bound to ceruloplasmin. So if we go back to this example that I just mentioned, so this is the example where it's not an acute flare up where a lot of hepatocytes are leaking copper, it's kind of more after that. And you can see here that in this case, if you measure the serum copper, this would actually be decreased compared to what our normal, uh, quote unquote, normal serum copper level would be. So depending on where you are in the disease state, it could be increased or decreased. And that's why we like to use serum ceruloplasmin more than serum copper. And of course, if you ever took a liver biopsy, it would show increased copper levels. So moving on to treatment of Wilson's disease, similar to hemochromatosis where we use iron chelators, we're gonna use copper chelators here. And some copper chelators that they want you to know are penicillamine, trientine, and oral zinc. And ultimately, if the damage is severe enough, you might, if they're a candidate for it, the definitive treatment would be a liver transplant. Now let's talk about another condition affecting the liver uh, called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And so first, I want to break down this word so we know exactly what's going on. We've talked about trypsin before in the pancreas lecture, and trypsin is a type of protease that we saw. And here from our pancreatic enzyme lecture, you can see that trypsin was useful for protein digestion. So if trypsin is a protease, it should stand to reason that an antitrypsin would be an antiprotease. And so in our body, there exists this balance between proteases and antiproteases. You don't want too many proteases in your body because they could actually overwhelm your defense system and start damaging your own tissue. And so alpha-1 antitrypsin is a type of antiprotease. And the condition we're gonna talk about, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, is where we have a deficiency in these antiproteases. And what we'll find especially in the lungs, that's most of the clinical sequelae of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency arises from this influx, this uh, relative increase of proteases that ends up damaging our own tissues. So the pathogenesis is a little bit different depending on which organ you're talking about. So it's gonna cause damage to both the liver and the lungs. So in the liver, what happens is that that alpha-1 antitrypsin protein is normally synthesized in our liver. In alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, what happens is that that protein that's supposed to be synthesized nicely and packaged and sent out, it's misfolded. And because it gets misfolded, that alpha-1 uh, antitrypsin protein starts to accumulate in your hepatocyte. It first accumulates in your endoplasmic reticulum, and then it starts to accumulate. Your body tries to package it into different organelles, but ultimately what's gonna happen is all that misfolded alpha-1 antitrypsin protein will overwhelm your hepatocytes and start to cause liver damage and cirrhosis. So again, if this is just a hepatocyte, and that's our endoplasmic reticulum, normally we can produce these AAT proteins and those can get secreted into the bloodstream and everybody's happy. In, in AAT, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, however, we're gonna have misfolding of that protein. And so it'll accumulate in your endoplasmic reticulum first, and ultimately it'll start accumulating throughout your uh, liver cells, and this can cause liver damage and eventually cirrhosis. In the lungs, it has a little bit different mechanism. So in the lungs, 
what's always happening is that you have this balance between proteases and antiproteases. So you need proteases in some cases because they'll help kill off pathogens and other materials. But normally if the proteases get to a region of the lung that they don't belong, you usually have antiproteases like alpha-1 antitrypsin that can help degrade those lung proteases and keep everything in order. As you might expect, if you have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, these proteases can now overwhelm the lungs and cause significant lung damage, specifically referred to as pan acinar emphysema. And I wanna talk about what pan acinar emphysema means versus sentry acinar emphysema. So pan acinar means, and pan always means everything. So like Pangea was when all the continents were in, in one specific area, right? So pan acinar means it's affecting the entire acinus. And you'll see this in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and it'll be most, uh, most notable in the lower lobes of the lungs. Let's contrast this with sentry acinar emphysema, which is where the inflammation only affects the proximal portion of the acinus and not the distal portion. This type of emphysema is related to smoking exposure and it most often occurs in the upper lobes. So what I wanna do now is I wanna draw out these differences so you don't forget it in the future. So we have our trachea and our lungs here. And if I take a zoomed in version of our lungs more distally, you're gonna have your terminal bronchioles and those will further uh, form into respiratory bronchioles and the respiratory bronchioles are attached directly to our alveoli. And remember from before, I talked about the alveoli a little bit in when I talked about ARDS and the pancreas, I just mentioned that these alveoli are the grape-like sacs that uh, communicate directly with our pulmonary capillaries. So this is where you actually get that gas exchange between uh, O2 and CO2. And to clarify where the acinus is in this picture, the acinus is defined as the alveoli and the respiratory bronchioles. So in this case, our acinus is this entire region here. So in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, you're gonna get a pan acinar emphysema across the entire acinus. And that's because these proteases have nothing to counter-regulate them. There's no alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is an antiprotease. There's nothing to stop them from going wherever they want and causing damage. And for that reason, you're gonna see inflammation and damage across the entire acinus. Let's contrast that with sentry acinar emphysema, which only affects the proximal acinus. The reason this happens is that when you smoke, the carcinogens are small, but not small enough. So they, they're, they, they're small enough to enter your terminal bronchial. They're small enough even to make it to some parts of your respiratory bronchioles. But at some point, the, the lumen becomes too small. And so the, most of the damage you're gonna find it's gonna be in the proximal portion of our acinus here. And the reason why in smoking, you have uh, smoking exposure affecting the upper lobe, it's because when you smoke, as we know, air rises. So once it enters the lungs, that smoke can still rise to the top upper lobes of your lung, and it'll cause this sentry acinar emphysema that we see here. And this will be most predominantly in those upper lobes. So in order to diagnose alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, you can do uh, what's called a serum protein genotype analysis. And you can also do a liver biopsy, which shouldn't surprise you because most of our conditions we've seen so far, a lot of times the gold standard is this liver biopsy. I do wanna spend a little bit of time on this serum protein genotype analysis because they do test uh, their the inheritance mechanism of alpha-1 antitrypsin because it's a co-dominant disorder. So as I just mentioned, alpha-1 antitrypsin is autosomal co-dominant. And sometimes they'll use this disease to see if you understand the basic genetics associated with it for step one and level one. So just to specify, uh, 
in our normal autosomal dominant disorders, so in not in co-dominant, let's just say a normal autosomal dominant disorder, one dominant allele will, will change the phenotype. You only need one. The second dominant allele is essentially redundant. However, in autosomal codominance, like we see in alpha-1 antitrypsin, each allele will impact the final phenotype. And so the classic example that I remember learning about in undergrad is if we take flowers and we assume that a big R is will create the phenotype red and a little, if you have multiple little Rs, you'll create the white phenotype. If we just take this really quick and talk about what happens, in autosomal code in autosomal dominant disorders, kind of more of our classic Mendelian genetics, what's going to happen is that as long as you have at least one of these big R's, your phenotype will still be red. You know, it, it's like I said, this second big R here is redundant to the phenotype. And if you have both little R's, that's the only way, if you have an autosomal recessive, that's the only way your phenotype will actually be the same phenotype that this allele provides. Now, autosomal codominant disorders are a little different in that if you have both big R's, sure, you'll still have this same phenotype. But the difference is that because every allele contributes, even this little tiny, this uh, little R will actually contribute to the final phenotype. So you'll get a mixture of red and white. So it might phenotypically look pink. And then finally, if you still have two little R's, you'll get white. The reason why I wanted to mention this framework is that we're gonna find out in autosome, in AAT, there's gonna be a few different phenotypes and each of them will contribute to the final uh, phenotypic load. So there's three alleles that you will have to know for step one and level one. There is our normal allele, our PIM allele, which each PIM allele will contribute 50% to your total uh, necessary alpha-1 antitrypsin production. You also have a PIS allele, which contributes 30%, and a PIZ allele, which only contributes 10%. And this PI is just, um, just so you know, the PI stands for protease inhibitor. Remember that alpha-1 antitrypsin is an antiprotease, which is the same thing as a protease inhibitor. So that's why it says PI. Uh, my mnemonics to remember the M versus the S versus the Z I think of the M as our mature uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin protein. So this is the one that's working as it should. I remember the S for slight. So it's working in some capacity, but it's not 100% working. And then I remember the Z as, you know, you're, the, it's catching some Zs. This protein's kind of sleeping on the job and only producing, you know, 10% of what it needs to. So let's go over the different genotypes, because remember, you'll get one of these alleles from your mom and one from your dad. So you can get two of these PIM alleles, so PIMM, which most of us have, and that's when you have your completely normal phenotype. You have 100% of your expected function here. Keep in mind, though, that you could actually get a PIM with a PIZ, so you can get a PIMZ uh, genotype. Or you can get like this uh, two of these PIS uh, alleles, and in both cases, it'll form about half of the function. And what, how do we get this sixty percent function? If you take fifty percent plus ten percent, that'll give you a sixty percent function for this specific genotype. And in this case, if you have two PIS alleles, that'll give you thirty plus thirty percent. So in both of these cases, you'll get sixty percent of your function. So you might have some symptoms. It, it's hard to say. It, it's it's very it's uh, quite variable actually at this specific genotype. What they will want you to know, especially though, they want you to know that this genotype, the PIZZ, is the worst possible uh, genotype, and it only gives you about twenty percent of the the function that you should have of alpha one antitrypsin. And so these are the people that are most at risk for significant liver cirrhosis, significant panacin or emphysema. And, and so just keep these uh, different genotypes in mind though on test day. And on liver biopsy, uh, I wanna go over one thing in particular here, 
and that is that this we can use a PAS diastase stain to detect alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So what did I just say? So PAS is our periodic acid shift stain. And all the PAS stain does, all I want you to know that it does, is it can detect complex tissues, uh, complex compounds within a cell. So it can detect polysaccharides, it can detect glycoproteins, it can detect glycolipids. And in this case, because uh, we're dealing with a misfolded alpha-1 antitrypsin protein that's being accumulated in our liver cells, we're going to be able to, de to detect that glycoprotein. Now, it doesn't end there. So the PAS stain, if it's positive, it doesn't tell us, hey, you have a glycoprotein. It'll just tell us you have something in your tissues. It could be a glycolipid. It could be a polysaccharide. So how do we differentiate this with other liver diseases? For example, you can have some liver diseases that have increased glycogen stores that can't get released from your liver. So how do we differentiate a glycogen from a glycoprotein? Well, that's where we have, oh, sorry about that. This is just simply stating what I just said. If you're PAS positive, you're gonna notice these purple, these, something's gonna stain purple here, and that's all the glycoproteins. Now, going back to what I just said, how do we tell the difference between whether or not all of this uh, material that's lighting up on the biopsy, how do we tell that this is glycogen versus a glycoprotein? Well, the nice thing is not only do we have a PAS stain, we can also stain this with something called diastase. And diastase will break down that glycogen. And because alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, forms misfolded glycoproteins instead of glycogen, you'll still have that enzyme present. You'll still have that glycoprotein present after it, the uh, biopsy specimen was stained with diastase. So it'll be diastase resistant. And so just to sum that all up, if you have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency on biopsy, it's gonna be PAS positive because you did find some sort of complex uh, compound within the tissues, in this case, glycoproteins, and it'll be diastase resistant because even if you pour a ton of diastase on the histology slide, you're not gonna break down the glycoproteins. It would only break down glycogen that was present. And while we're here, let's just kind of uh, throw a call back to our small intestine lecture. I don't know if you remember, do you remember which small intestinal uh, infection yielded PAS positive organisms on intestinal biopsy? And so that was actually Whipple disease. And this is from our small intestine lecture. I just want you to remember that you can get PAS positive foamy macrophages in the lamina propria. And my mnemonic for that was this can of whip pass and that PAS was for, for this specific finding. And I'm actually just gonna go back one second because I wanna specify something. In the case of Whipple disease, remember how in Whipple we could not excrete a lot of our uh, lipids. They ended up getting trapped in there because our macrophages were compressing our lacteals and we couldn't excrete our lipids from our enterocytes into our thoracic duct. So what was happening there was we were actually getting excessive glycolipids in the case of Whipple disease. And that's why in Whipple disease, you'll get a PAS positive stain, not for any polysaccharide or glycoprotein, but because of this glycolipid. Now let's move on to some of the hereditary hyperbilirubinemia syndromes. So these syndromes are a collection of autosomal recessive genetic conditions that either affect your ability to conjugate bilirubin or your ability to excrete bilirubin. And so I'm going to break them down into two different categories. Here's our conjugation disorders, and here's our excretion disorders. And something I want to mention is that the classic hyperbilirubinemia syndromes are the first two on this list, this Gilbert's and Kriegler and Ajar, and then Dubin Johnson versus Roeder. I'm gonna add these physiologic, this isn't technically an autosomal recessive condition. This is actually just, as the name suggests, part of our natural upbringing, it's physiologic. And then this biliary atresia, it's not technically an autosomal recessive condition either, but it'll cause some of the same findings that you'll see in these other two. So that's why I, I, I lump them like this. I think it'll be easy to understand as we go through this.
So let's start by talking about all of the conditions that will affect the conjugation of bilirubin, starting with Gilbert syndrome. So in Gilbert syndrome, the pathogenesis is uh, mildly decreased UDP glucurono, hold on, glucuronosal transferase. I'm just going to call that UGT. So mildly decreased UGT activity, which will lead to impaired bilirubin conjugation. And so if you remember from earlier in our liver section, we had our, all of our unconjugated bilirubin can be converted into the by the liver into conjugated bilirubin. And that's done by that UGT enzyme. And the, how this works is that, remember that our unconjugated bilirubin is water unsoluble. And so what's gonna happen is that UGT can actually add on a glucuronic acid, which is a water soluble compound. It can add that onto this unconjugated bilirubin and create a more water soluble compound, namely conjugated bilirubin. And if your bilirubin is conjugated and it's water soluble, then it can enter that water soluble uh, bile and actually get excreted. So that's the whole point of this process. In, uh, in Gilbert's disease, what's gonna happen is that our UGT activity is mildly decreased. So it still works, but it's just a little bit uh, lower activity than we'd like. And so if we have that, um, I'll explain what, what that'll actually cause in just a moment. Uh, most of the time, Gilbert's is asymptomatic. You're just gonna find a mildly elevated uh, con unconjugated bilirubin if you, if you did lab studies. And going back to our slide that we just talked about, because this is mildly decreased, the UGT activity is mildly decreased, what can happen is that you can get a buildup of unconjugated bilirubin. And this usually doesn't happen all the time. It's more often you'll notice it during times of stress. So if somebody's stressed, like they have, they're sick or they're studying for a big exam or they're fasting, what's gonna happen is that you're gonna get more of a buildup of that unconjugated bilirubin and it might present clinically with some signs like jaundice you might see because of that bilirubin buildup. Fortunately, this is a benign condition. So you just have to reassure them and let them know about the condition moving forward. The more significant condition uh, and the essentially the more extreme version of Gilbert's disease is Kriegler-Najjar syndrome. And so Kriegler-Najjar is either significantly decreased or absence of that UGT enzyme. So now if we go back to our framework we talked about before, what's happening here is that we'll just assume we have absent uh, UGT activity. And so if we have absent, then you're going to get obviously significantly elevated unconjugated bilirubin as well. Now, because you have zero way for your unconjugated bilirubin to convert into conjugated, this is going to present a lot more severely and a lot earlier in life. You're usually going to see it in infancy. You're going to notice a significant uh, hyperbilirubinemia, especially unconjugated, which will give you jaundice. Another thing I want to mention here is that that unconjugated bilirubin can end up going into your brain and that can cause a really, really dangerous condition called kernicterus. So kernicterus is a potentially fatal deposition of unconjugated bilirubin in your brain. And what'll happen is that that unconjugated bilirubin gets into your brain and it's a neurotoxin. So it can cause irreversible brain damage. And like I said, it can actually cause death. And they do like to, they want you to know where the unconjugated bilirubin preferentially deposits, and it's in the basal ganglia of the brain. So why does this happen? So the blood, the blood brain barrier is lipid soluble. And remember that unconjugated bilirubin is also lipid soluble. Remember how it's water unsoluble. So it's a water insoluble, which actually makes it lipid soluble. And another thing I want to point out is that the blood brain barrier is less developed in newborns. And because of that, they have a higher risk of kernicterus than let's say if I had unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, my risk of kernicterus would still be quite low. So let's go over how that works. So if this is our blood, we have epithelial cells and we have podocytes. And then if it, if it can make it past both of those, 
then it can make it into our brain. That's our blood brain barrier. So remember that this is lipid soluble. So if you have some sort of hydrophilic water soluble substance and it tries to get in, your blood brain barrier is gonna send it back into the bloodstream. On the other hand, if you have hydrophobic substances like unconjugated bilirubin, that can actually diffuse across and make it into the brain. So like I said, unconjugated bilirubin is lipid soluble. So it's able to cross this and make it into the brain. And as I mentioned before, it prefers depositing in the basal ganglia of the brain. And something I do want to point out again, just to make sure we understand it, because the blood brain barrier is less developed in newborns, they have the highest risk of developing kernicterus. If you have a unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia in adults, let's say somebody has uh, Jill Bear's disease and they're going through a stressful episode where their unconjugated bilirubin is mildly elevated, it's very, very, very unlikely to cause kernicterus because their blood brain barrier is developed enough to where it's not going to allow some of these lipophilic substances like unconjugated bilirubin into the brain. So obviously here we're talking about Kriegler Najjar, which is an unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia that's happening very, very early in life. It's causing kernicterus. There's two subtypes. They mention on almost every resource I've seen, but I haven't really seen it tested. So the type one Kriegler Najjar is the most severe form. The type two is the less severe form. And the only thing you need to know is that for type two, there are two treatments you can use. You can use this phenobarbital and clofibrate. Again, I don't know how important this is for you to recognize. I remember it that, that the type two uh, being not requiring two drugs or you can use two drugs to treat type two. And I remember the, the bi, B-I as, you know, like my bicycle means two wheels. So I remember that bi and phenobarbital as one of my drugs and then clofibrate. I guess you just have to remember that on your own. And to treat this, as you can do with other uh, conditions that cause unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia in uh, newborns, you can either do a plasmapheresis or you can do phototherapy. And both of these, what they'll do is they'll increase the water solubility of unconjugated bilirubin. Notably that none of these treatments actually conjugate bilirubin and, and they will try to trick you on a test, especially with the next condition we'll talk about. So that's Kriegler-Najjar syndrome. I want to discuss ph physiologic neonatal jaundice because it has some of the same mechanisms that we just talked about for the other conditions, actually. So this is not an inborn uh, genetic mutation. What's happening here is that when we're born, all, all newborns have some sort of UGT deficiency, and it's temporary. It takes a little bit of time, you know, on the order of a few, a couple weeks, in order for your UGT enzymes to be working as well as they need to, to appropriately conjugate all the bilirubin in their blood. And so normally speaking, uh, you'll find this either in a newborn who's asymptomatic, who you're just giving them a normal bilirubin screen, and it, you notice an elevated unconjugated bilirubin, or you might notice this symptomatically with uh, jaundice. And again, a complication of having too much unconjugated bilirubin in your system will be kernicterus. And you're gonna treat this, if you need to, you're gonna treat this with phototherapy. And what that'll do is that'll increase the water solubility of unconjugated bilirubin, but notably it does not conjugate your bilirubin. And usually the prognosis is very good. Like I said, this is physiologic, it should recover. And the, as your UGT activity starts to work more toward baseline, your symptoms will resolve. And something, I don't know if I pointed it out well enough here, I just wanna clarify on a test question, how they're gonna present this. They're gonna say, hey, you got a newborn who's got jaundice. They're gonna show you the lab value where it has an elevated unconjugated bilirubin. They're gonna either tell you what's going on and you just let them know it's physiologic neonatal jaundice, or they'll kind of take it a step further and they'll say, hey, or they'll ask you what complication can happen. So you'll have to know that it can be pernicterous. They might ask you where in the brain this will happen. You'll have to say the basal ganglia. But the thing I wanted to emphasize even more is that 
sometimes they'll give you this whole picture and they'll say they're going to treat it with phototherapy and they're going to say what's the mechanism of action of of this treatment modality and one of the answer choices will absolutely be this treatment will end up conjugating bilirubin and that will be the wrong answer you have to pick it that it increases the water solubility of unconjugated bilirubin so just keep that in mind they, they do like this question quite a bit now we can move on from the conjugation disorders and focus on disorders of bilirubin excretion so let's start with dubin johnson syndrome so the pathogenesis of this as i alluded to is defective bilirubin excretion from the liver keep in mind that the hepatocytes are still able to conjugate the bilirubin they just can't get it out of the hepatocytes and into the bile duct like it should go. So if we look at our framework here, we've already talked about in Gilbert's and kriegler najjar and in physiologic neonatal jaundice, our big problem revolved around this UGT enzyme. And because the UGT wasn't working as well as it needed to, we always ended up getting a significant amount of unconjugated bilirubin in our blood. What's happening in these excretion disorders is that this UGT enzyme is working just fine. The real problem is that we're having a trouble, once we've formed this conjugated bilirubin, we're having trouble getting it into our bile ducts and excreting it. And so again, this will usually be asymptomatic, and sometimes you'll be able to see elevated conjugated bilirubin on labs. And if we go back to our framework here, if this is blocked off, if this X is blocked off, it shouldn't surprise you that you're gonna get an increase of conjugated bilirubin, which is different than the unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia that we've been seeing in Gilbert's, Kriegler, Najjar, and physiologic neonatal jaundice. And there you can see this conjugated bilirubin can get detected in the blood. My mnemonic for Dubin-Johnson, uh, I, I always think of this as, I'm a San Francisco Giants fan, and I always remembered this for, uh, we had Mauricio Dubon on our team for a little bit. And I just picture this Dubin Johnson, this is like a matchup between uh, pitcher Randy Johnson and uh, Mauricio Dubon. So what's happening here, how I picture this in my head is that the baseball is still getting thrown to the batter. So we're still getting it conjugated. So from the pitcher to the batter, and then uh, Mauricio Dubon just hits one out of the park. And so the Billy Rubin ends up all the way over here into the bloodstream. So that helped me remember that the Dubin-Johnson, you do actually conjugate it before it goes into the bloodstream. And what you'll find in, in Dubin-Johnson syndrome is that if you look at the liver, let's say you did some sort of like cholecystectomy or appendectomy, and you just happen to look at the liver, you'll notice the liver is darker in color. And you'll remember that dark liver for Dubin-Johnson, the D in dark and the D in Dubin-Johnson coincide. And you don't have to do anything with this condition. It's, it's a benign condition. You don't have to worry about it. Let's talk about rotor syndrome now. So this is an even milder form of Dubin-Johnson. And again, it's just uh, defective biliary excretion, but you can conjugate it just fine. So it's the same thing we just talked about as Dubin-Johnson, where this isn't working. So you're, you might get an elevated conjugated bilirubin. And this time, instead of having that dark liver that we saw in Dubin Johnson, the liver color is regular. It's your normal liver color. So you'll remember the R in rotor syndrome will remind you of the regular liver color. Let's finish this off by talking about biliary atresia, which again, technically isn't an autosomal recessive condition, but it, it will present very similarly to what we just talked about. <clears throat> So what's happening in biliary atresia is that you have, for whatever reason, you have destruction of your bile ducts. And so that's gonna cause impaired bilirubin excretion. So on laboratory findings, just like in Dubin-Johnson and rotor syndrome, you're gonna find an elevated conjugated or direct bilirubin in the blood. And so let's find out what this looks like. Again, if our bile ducts are getting destroyed, we have atretic bile ducts here, then again, you're going to not be able to conjugate the, I mean, you're not going to be able to move this conjugated bilirubin for excretion. So you'll get a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So 
for any time you have any sort of bilirubin in your system, whether it's conjugated or unconjugated, you can get jaundice. You can also get dark urine and acolic stools. And I'll talk about why this happens. So in the case of uh, jaundice, we know that anytime you have any sort of bilirubin in your blood, you'll end up with jaundice. Dark urine, we've talked about before. If you ever have conjugated bilirubin entering your bloodstream, conjugated bilirubin is water soluble. And so that can actually get excreted in the kidneys and show up as dark urine. And then finally, acolic stools or pale colored stools uh, you need bilirubin in your GI tract in order to provide that brown pigment in the stool as stercobilin. And if no bilirubin's making it to your GI tract, you're going to get pale stools. And just as a heads up, technically this could happen in Rotor and Dubin Johnson as well. Anytime you have conjugated bilirubin in your blood, you can have dark urine. And anytime you don't have enough conjugated bilirubin in your GI tract, you can also get acolic stools. They don't really emphasize that on tests, though, for those two conditions. I would really just remember, you know, asymptomatic elevated conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And then just remember that Dubin Johnson has the dark liver and rotor syndrome has the regular liver. Taking a step back now, let's go back to biliary atresia here. So we've mentioned these three symptoms, a symptom that is notably absent in any of this, these conjugated hyperbilirubinemias is kernicterus. You will not get kernicterus in any of the excretion disorders that we just discussed. The reason why is that our blood-brain barrier is lipid soluble. So hydrophobic substances like unconjugated bilirubin can diffuse across this barrier. Now hydrophilic substances like conjugated bilirubin get denied entry. So it doesn't matter how much conjugated bilirubin you have in your system, in Dubin-Johnson, rotors, or biliary atresia, you have a very low risk of kernicterus because it's these water-soluble compounds cannot diffuse across your blood-brain barrier. And you need to treat this with surgical correction because otherwise you're going to have the same problems coming up over and over again, and you'll, you'll never be able to excrete your bilirubin as you should. Our last liver section, we're going to talk about hepatic encephalopathy and Rye syndrome. We'll go back to our liver physiology and a little bit of our liver cirrhosis lecture during this because I talked about hepatic encephalopathy there for uh, briefly. So in our physiology section, I mentioned that ammonia is a potentially toxic byproduct of digestion and how we... Uh, remedy this problem is that we can actually convert ammonia to urea in our liver, and then that urea can get safely excreted in our kidneys. So if we have ammonia, it'll go through the liver and get converted to urea, and everybody's happy. What happens though, if you have a defective liver, let's say you have liver cirrhosis, what's going to happen is that this process won't work as well, and you might get a buildup of ammonia in your blood. And if you have a buildup of ammonia in your blood, it can lead to a condition known as hepatic encephalopathy. So hepatic encephalopathy is uh, caused by decreased ammonia metabolism. And all that ammonia in your bloodstream can lead to neurologic dysfunction. This will present, as the name suggests, with encephalopathy or al altered mental status. You'll also see something called asterixis. And what does asterixis looks like? You're gonna have your patient put their arms out and point their fingers to the ceiling while keeping their arms spread out in front of them. And if you push, you can either push back on their arm or sometimes you don't even have to do anything. If you just have them you know, stretch their arms out straight ahead with their fing fingers pointing the ceiling, um, you'll notice that their uh, arms, their hands and their wrists especially start doing this flapping tremor. So it'll start to do this flapping tremor like this. And that's uh, indicative of, that's a physical exam maneuver that you can do to increase your clinical suspicion for hepatic encephalopathy. And this can get very severe. It's not like it just causes altered mental status. If you have uh, severe hepatic encephalopathy, it can lead to coma or even death. So there's a few different things that can cause hepatic encephalopathy. 
most of which are related to liver cirrhosis. We just talked about why liver cirrhosis would cause that buildup. You can also have people who have some sort of baseline cirrhosis, but they're able to metabolize ammonia at some uh, steady state. But if they have an acute GI bleed where additional ammonia is being released, or if they have an infection where the bacteria is releasing ammonia, or they have renal failure, all of these types of conditions can increase the amount of ammonia in your bloodstream and cause a problem. So in renal failure, what's happening here is that normally that urea gets excreted in the kidneys, but if your kidneys aren't working, you can get a buildup of urea and that can actually uh, backflow and cause a buildup of ammonia as well. One thing I wanna mention, and we talked about this earlier, is that a TIPS procedure, which is often used not often, but it is occasionally used to treat significant portal hypertension, ascites, varices, things of that nature, a TIPS procedure can ultimately precipitate hepatic encephalopathy. So what's happening here is that if we have a lot of ammonia, normally it's going to go through our liver and be converted into urea, as we've talked about. In a TIPS procedure, which is done to alleviate portal hypertension here, what will happen is that this portal fluid can now drain directly into our hepatic vein, which will alleviate our portal hypertension and congestion. So that sounds great, but the problem with that is that now all this ammonia is also bypassing the liver and going straight into our hepatic vein. So instead of being converted into urea for excretion, we now have excess ammonia in our system, which can precipitate hepatic encephalopathy. There's two treatments I want you to know for hepatic encephalopathy, and those are lactulose and rifaximin. And I'm gonna go over the mechanisms now. So lactulose, uh, for lactulose, I want you to, we were, were gonna talk a little bit about acids and bases. So ammonia, NH3 is a base. And what is a base versus an acid? So back to basics. So an acid is anything that can basically get rid of its hydrogen ion. And a base is anything that can accept the hydrogen ion. So there you go, acids donate protons and bases accept them. And you can remember this by just remembering that that hydrogen ion always moves from point A, which is your acid, to point B, your base. So here we have an acid, it gives off its hydrogen. And in the case of ammonia, ammonia can grab that hydrogen and turn into ammonium. So it, it, it grabbed that proton and now it's got a uh, positive charge on it, as you can see. So in the case of lack, uh, in the case of ammonia versus ammonium, what I want you to realize is that this NH3, the ammonia form, can easily cross our GI tract barrier and enter our bloodstream. But this NH4 positive ammonium cation uh, cannot easily cross our GI tract barrier because of this positive charge. So how do we use this? physiologic discrepancy to benefit us in, in a patient with hepatic encephalopathy. Well, what we can do is we can give somebody lactulose and lactulose will break down to a lot of lactic acids. And those acids naturally will release a ton of protons and ammonia will see all those protons that are being released and it'll start binding to them because it's a base. It'll bind to those proteins and create a bunch of ammonium cations. And fortunately for us, these ammonium cations cannot uh, uh, be absorbed by our GI tract and they'll instead be excreted. So in this way, we're helping with our hepatic encephalopathy by not allowing any of the, any new ammonia into our system. Rifaximin works in a little bit of a different way. So rifaximin is an antibiotic and normally we have bacteria in our GI tract that can produce ammonia. So here's our GI tract bugs and they're producing ammonia which can ultimately be absorbed into our bloodstream. Rifaximin is an antibiotic that can help kill some of these bacteria that are producing all that ammonia. So if we have rifaximin coming in, it'll take out some of those bacteria, which will ultimately decrease our ammonia in our GI tract and our bloodstream. Now let's change gears a little bit and talk about what Rye syndrome is. So Rye syndrome is hepatic encephalopathy that occurs in childhood. And if you think about all the causes of hepatic encephalopathy that we talked about, we talked about liver cirrhosis, 
We talked about GI bleeds, hips procedure, really significant infections. Most of those don't happen in childhood. So the reason why a child would have hepatic encephalopathy is through aspirin consumption. So what happens here is a child will consume aspirin and that'll actually cause damage to the, the mitochondria inside the hepatocytes. And so if we go back to our liver lobules and zones that we saw in our liver anatomy section, I mentioned that zone three has the highest mitochondrial top content. And in the case of Rye syndrome, what's happening here is that this aspirin will interact with these mitochondria in the hepatocytes and it'll start to kill off this zone that can damage the entire hepatocyte and, and result in Rye syndrome or acute hepatic encephalopathy. So you might get nausea and vomiting. They can go into a coma and it can lead to death. Because again, if you're if you have this acute liver failure essentially, where all of your hepatocytes are dying, then all that ammonia that's supposed to be converted to urea will just stay as ammonia and it'll uh, flow through your bloodstream and it can cause, like I said, it can cause coma and death even. On histology, you're gonna find microvesicular fatty changes. There's been a few lectures now, uh, maybe not a few lectures, there's been a few liver conditions that we talked about earlier that caused macrovesicular changes. So this is the first time I'm gonna mention microvesicular changes. So these are changes where you'll notice small vesicles inside of hepatocytes. And if we take one of these cells here, you can notice how there's several small vesicles. I'll, I'll remove the circle. So you can see all those mini circles inside of there. Those are small vesicles inside of each hepatocyte. Notice that these vesicles do not distort the nucleus. You can see the nucleus in the center of the cell still. And here's a couple other cells I've highlighted where the nucleus hasn't been pushed to the side of the cell. It's still comfortably in the middle of the cell. And my mnemonic for remembering that Rye syndrome causes microvesicular changes is that Rye syndrome itself is a childhood disorder. So it's kind of a disorder that would happen when you're a micro person. We'll contrast that with our macrovesicular changes that I discussed earlier. And in macrovesicular changes, you're gonna have one large fat globule, one large vesicle. We don't get any more of those microvesicular changes in this case. You can actually see microvesicular changes here. This is a good slide because it shows microvesicular changes here, these little mini circles. But in macrovesicular changes, you're gonna mostly have these predominant fat globules. And what these globules will do is they end up pushing the nucleus to the side of the cell. You can't even see the nucleus inside the cell. And you'll see these in more adult condition, fatty liver disease, alcoholic liver disease, some forms of viral hepatitis. And I remember that by thinking that these changes happen when you are you know, a macro person, you're an adult, and so you'll see these macro vesicular changes. Uh, one thing before I end on um, Rye syndrome specifically is that you, al you always want to avoid aspirin consumption in childhood other than the condition Kawasaki disease. The reason why we give aspirin in Kawasaki disease is we basically accept that there is a risk of Rye syndrome, but we also know that Kawasaki disease is such a dangerous inflammatory disorder that can basically cause uh, sudden death with cardiac uh, coronary an aneurysms. So it's one of those rare conditions where we just we give aspirin knowing that it has a risk of Rye syndrome only because aspirin is so effective in treating Kawasaki syndrome or Kawasaki disease, I should say. So that's it for Rye syndrome. And that actually concludes the liver lecture and our entire 10 part GI lecture series. I appreciate those of you who have stuck around through these. And if you haven't, that's not a problem either. Uh, let me know in the comment section what you thought of this lecture series. If it was too long, if I should have added more question answer style format, if I went too in depth on other concepts, or if you liked that sort of integrated format. Um, my schedule is a little busy in the coming months, but in the future, if this series is well received, I'd be willing to do another one of these in the future. So I'd like to know what worked and what didn't so that I can plan it if I do in fact do another lecture going forward.
So thank you all for your time. It's been fun and I will hopefully see you again sometime.